Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. So, about last night's game. I don't think I need to say the obvious that this game was absolutely atrocious, and was one of the worst performances any NFL team has ever put out on a football field. The Los Angeles Chargers, fighting for their playoff lives, or at least whatever was left of them, didn't just lose to their division rival in the Las Vegas Raiders. Rather, they got flat out embarrassed, losing the game by a final score of 63-21. And the final score is a bit deceiving, because the Chargers' offense was terrible, seeing as not only did they turn it over five times, but seeing as the Raiders were up 49-0 before the Chargers even so much as crossed midfield. The Raiders were shut out the previous week, and their 14 games so far this season had only scored 20 or more in two of them. And yet, here they were, the team that picked up eight first downs and got shut out on Sunday, able to put up 63, becoming just the third team in the last 30 years to accomplish this feat. It was the most points ever allowed by the Chargers, the most points ever scored by the Raiders, and the most points ever allowed in the history of Thursday Night Football and it marked just the second time in the post-merger era that a team scored 63 or more points in a game. That's how bad it was. We're talking historically inept territory here. This was the kind of performance that lives on in NFL history for just how bad it was. Because truly, the first half might have been the worst single half of football any team has ever played. And as if this man right here's seat couldn't get any hotter than it already was, Brandon Staley's seat has the fire of a thousand suns right now. By the time you're watching this video, honestly, it wouldn't shock me if Staley was no longer the coach of the Chargers. His stint was a disaster, as the Chargers will officially miss the playoffs this year, having clinched a losing record, despite insane expectations going into the season. In three seasons at the helm, despite having a franchise quarterback on the roster, Staley made the playoffs just once, blowing a 27-0 lead in that game. Despite the talent on that roster and despite several expectations, the Chargers went just 24-24 under Staley's tenure, assuming he gets fired right now. And on Thursday night, it was apparent. This was a Charger team that flat-out quit on their head coach. Everything was bad. Literally, everything was bad. From offense, to defense, to special teams, to discipline, to everything else under the sun. And with the Chargers down 42-0 at the half, having not crossed midfield, and having only stopped the Raiders once, despite the fact that the Raiders scored zero points the week before, people were wondering whether Staley would even return for the second half. Seriously, it was that bad. Wanna know how bad it was? Listen to this from the halftime crew at Amazon where Richard Sherman flat out said that Staley should be fired at halftime. I mean, this is one of the worst first halves I've seen from a team. It look, just looks like they've given up. They've quit. They're, they, they've packed their bags. they packed all their suitcases. They've booked their vacations, and they're ready to go. Brandon Staley, I hate, I hate to say this because you don't ever want to call for somebody's job, but they should fire him for They should make history. They should fire him at halftime. <laughs> I should just, hey, we got an Uber X carpool outside and we'll, we'll send you on your way because right now I've never seen a team come out this uninspired. And, and I think when he said that, everyone's mind turned to two questions. Number one, can you do that? Can you fire a coach at halftime? Logistically and practically speaking, are you allowed to fire a coach at halftime? Well, the answer to that is yes. You can do whatever you want to. But number two, has this ever been done before, where a coach was relieved of his duties in the middle of the game? And amazingly enough, the answer to that question is also yes. Because today feels like as good of a time as ever to talk about the one time in NFL history that a man got fired at the half. In fact, it was so long ago 
that it wasn't even known as the NFL yet. It was known as the American Professional Football Association, or the APFA. But back in 1921, the Rock Island Independents fired their head coach, Frank Coughlin, before the end of the game. They fired him right around halftime. And this is the story behind the only time in NFL history that a head coach was fired in the middle of the game. Now, before I talk about the actual firing and how it played out, we need some context to understand how the season was going up until that point, and why tensions were rising between management and the head coach. And before I go any further, I apologize in advance for the still images, but as you can probably expect, there is not any surviving footage of what happened in 1921, so this video is going to be edited a lot differently than my usual style of editing, so just bear with me on that. It's October 16th, 1921, and the Rock Island Independents are traveling to Chicago to take on the Cardinals. I can't say what was a big game and what wasn't in terms of the standings, seeing as back in 1921, teams played an uneven number of games, so it's not as though a win was necessary to fight for first place with time running out on the season, or to make the playoffs or anything like that. Having said that, the Independents desperately needed a win, because this season had not gone according to plan for them at all. In 1920, the Independents were one of the better teams in football, they finished the season with a 6-2-2 record, and ended the season with the third most points in the league. However, they were looking for a new head coach, as this man right here, Rue Ursella, was not going to be returning to the club in 1921. Ursella felt like the guy that could get you to the hump, but couldn't get you over, especially as his ability to play was on the decline. As one writer said on Ursella and his tactics, there isn't a doubt that Rube has seen his best days as a player, and he is regarded generally as too good a fellow, too easygoing, to act as a mentor to a fighting 11. Translation, Ursella was too soft, his play was on the decline, and he wasn't head coach material. He was going to get Rock Island to the next step. And with that, prior to the start of the 1921 season, they hired this man right here, Frank Coughlin. Coughlin was one of the most prominent football players in the collegiate ranks, having played at Notre Dame, and serving as the captain for the 1920 team that was named the national champion and outscored its opponents a whopping 251-44 over the course of the nine-game season, during which they won all nine games. This seemed like a best-of-both-worlds scenario. Rock Island was thrilled to be adding Coughlin, and likewise, Coughlin was thrilled to be going to Rock Island. Coughlin actually visited the team back in 1920 and was impressed by them, so going there in 1921 made a ton of sense. Flanagan really wanted Coughlin, and the bidding war was intense, but the idea was that if you got Coughlin, you could get a lot of other Notre Dame players to come join him as well. And seeing as Notre Dame just won the national championship the year before, and seeing as the college ranks were viewed as better than the pro ranks at the time, it was a move that made a ton of sense. Getting Notre Dame players is always a good thing, and Coughlin promised that not only would Rock Island be a winning ball club, but they would get a lot of good talent as well. Said Coughlin, I have many new men in view, and I have reached terms with several of them. I'll tell the fans who they are in the near future. Rock Island will have a stronger 11 next fall than they had last season. A bold statement, but one that Flanagan was begging on Coughlin to back up, because the expectations at this point were officially sky high. However, as you can probably expect based on the title of this video, that did not happen. Not at all. Because this 1921 team through the first two games was significantly different and significantly worse than the 1920 team that dominated much of the APFA season. Through two games, the Independents had yet to win, tying the Detroit Tigers nothing nothing and losing 14-10 to to the Chicago Staleys. The Tigers would only win one game that season, that tells you how bad that was. And part of why they were a struggling ball club was because Coughlin, simply put, wasn't that good of a coach. And it wasn't because he was inexperienced, or the players never gravitated toward him, or anything like that. Rather, it was for a completely different reason. Now this should go without saying, but what is one of the primary responsibilities of anyone who has a job for that matter? especially a head coach. Show up to work. Show up to freaking work. 
it's not exactly a job that you can do remotely. And Coughlin, uh, Coughlin did not do that. Not at all. And that was a problem with Coughlin, because he lived all the way in South Bend and refused to move to Rock Island after getting the head coaching job with the Independents. The distance between Rock Island, where the Independents play, and South Bend, where he lived, was 225 miles. It's a fairly long commute, especially back in 1921, when you're probably taking such a commute by train. I highly doubt you're driving 450 miles round trip in the 1920s. I suppose you could make the commute, but here's the problem. Coughlin rarely did that. He just trained in South Bend by himself so that he'd be in game shape whenever the Independents played. But in terms of actually coaching the team, he would rarely, if ever, actually be at Rock Island, being there just three days a week. We've seen players have long, bizarre commutes before. I did a video about one player on the Buffalo Bills that lived all the way in Canada and made that commute. You can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. But he never wasn't there. Coughlin wasn't there. For the majority of the week, Coughlin wouldn't even be in Rock Island. Most of the practice sessions and drills would be run by this man right here, assistant player coach Jimmy Konzelman, who would eventually become a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame and would become one of the greatest coaches in the history of the sport, winning the NFL championship twice. But Coughlin was in Indiana by himself while the team was based in Illinois. And this was starting to tick off this man right here, manager Walter Flanagan especially with the team winless through its first two games. It felt like he had been duped. There were a few other players that didn't practice with the team, and instead, practiced by themselves. Flanagan said that this wasn't going to happen anymore. You're not going to be a part of the team and work remotely. If you don't live in Rock Island, or at the very least, you don't show up to practice every day, you're gone. Flanagan cut some players like Dave Hayes and Freeman Fitzgerald, but kept Coughlin on, at least for the moment. However, by this point, you could sense that the writing was on the wall. It's not like Coughlin didn't have a valid reason to be in South Bend. Coughlin was an extremely smart man who graduated at the top of his class and was a practicing attorney at a time where pro football paid pennies compared to other lines of work, especially the legal profession. But in terms of being a head coach at the same time that you're living 225 miles away, that's just not going to work, especially when you didn't win your first two games. With that in mind, as the Independents were taking on the Cardinals in their third game of the season, the Independents were up 14-7, with Kozelman throwing one of the touchdowns and scoring another one. And that's when Flanagan decided that it was time to move on from this man right here, Frank Coughlin. And if he was going to do it, it would have to be at a time when Coughlin was actually with the team. Kalzelman was playing well, he was in game shape, and he was basically coaching this team anyways while Coughlin was in South Bend. So Flanagan decided that the best time to cut ties was in the middle of this game. As Bob Ronwer and Bob Carroll recall on what happened next, Ed Healy, one of the players on the team, replaced Coughlin in the middle of the game. From there, once Coughlin was safely on his way toward the sideline, Healy delivered a message to Konzelman from Flanagan. Coughlin was fired. The new coach was Konzelman. Whether it was that big of an adjustment, it's hard to say. Again, this man right here, Jimmy Konzelman, was basically coaching the team most of the time anyways, seeing as Coughlin didn't live anywhere near Rock Island and didn't show up half the time. But it was official. A coach had been fired at halftime. For the first and today, the only time in the history of the NFL, or the APFA as it was known back in 1921, the man in charge was relieved of his duties midway through the game. As for what happened next, Jimmy Conselman coached the team for the rest of the season, and Rock Island ended up playing really well. After they won the game against the Cardinals, they ended the year with a 4-2-1 record, doing a lot better than they were doing when Coughlin was in charge. Now, Coughlin was cut from the team a few days later, and bounced around the Detroit Tigers and the Green Bay Packers, but then never played again after the 1921 season, instead returning to South Bend to focus on his law practice. So even though this decision might not have made a lot of sense if you were on the outside looking in, it was absolutely the right call. 
Rock Island made out very well at the end of the day going with Councilman instead of Coughlin. Again, as much as everyone wanted to see it happen in last night's game, if you're watching as of this video getting released with this man right here and Brandon Staley, there has never been a coach since then that has been fired at halftime or in the middle of a game. And that took a bizarre set of circumstances that involved a head coach that didn't show up because the commute was too long and because the team was losing. Kalzman was pretty much the de facto head coach anyway, so it's not like this was a big deal. I guess Flanagan was so optimistic that Coughlin could actually get players from Notre Dame to join the team that he was willing to overlook the fact that Coughlin wasn't actually going to be living in Rock Island. And when the performance wasn't there, Flanagan was looking for a way out after what felt like broken promises. But I think it's safe to say that in 1921, the coaching tenure of Frank Coughlin with the Rock Island Independence ended on incredibly rocky terms. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.